In 1968, J. Edgar Hoover, then the head of the FBI, called the Black Panthers the single greatest threat to the internal security of the United States. Armed and militant, they said that racism would not end without violence. Joining me now are one former Black Panther, Elaine Brown. She became the Panthers' leader in 1974, and she has just written a memoir of that time called A Taste of Power. Also joining me, Kwame Ture, formerly known as Stokely Carmichael. He has recently updated his book, Black Power. You remember the slogan, Black Power, with him when he was one of the leaders of the Student uh, Nonviolent Coordinating Committee. Why, oh, your memory's excellent. Yes, I, I do remember that. Uh, that was my time. Uh, let me start with Elaine first, because tell, let me just review where some of the people that were part of, of I assume like we could say the revolution that both of you were part of, or the protests that you were part of, the militants you were part of. Huey Newton, dead. Yes. Shot in, in a drug deal or something in, in well, Oakland. Well, he was killed on the streets of Oakland. Killed on the yeah. streets of Oakland. Yeah. Um, H. Rap Brown is where? Your colleague. He's in Atlanta, Georgia. Doing what? He's a Muslim. He's the head of a mosque there. He has the name now, Amin, Amin El Amin. Yeah. Do you two know, stay in touch, talk? Oh, yes, oh, yes. we talk all the time. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, Eldridge Cleaver. He's in the Oakland area, yeah. I believe. He's, he's not of the same faith that you are anymore, is <laughs> no. he? He's, a, he's in Oakland. I don't know what he is I doing exactly. I read an article yeah. about him not that long ago, but I don't know exactly what he's doing. And Kathleen Cleaver went to Yale Law School, and yes, she's and she, where? I think she's a professor now at a law school, yeah. but I'm not sure where. I thought Atlanta. it was Emory. It's not yeah. Emory? It's, I it, thought it was Emory. Yeah. I'm not I sure. Th I think I remember. Yeah. Uh, and Fred Hampton was killed in Chicago yes. by the police, uh, shot in the head. Um, who am I missing? There is also, who was the young man who, who was, I think, may have been the defense minister, but was just elected to Congress. Bobby Rush. Bobby in Rush. Chicago. Out of yes. Chicago, just yes. elected to, to Congress. Congress. Yes. Yeah. Did you think you'd ever see a member of the Black Panthers elected to the Congress of the United States when you were in the midst of, of the action you were engaged in? Well, certainly. We, uh, Ron Dellums went to the Congress. Course, Everybody Ron thought Dellums he was a Black Panther. He's been there a long time. He may be chairman of the, yes. <laughs> of the Defense of the Armed Services that's Committee of the right. House. That's totally inconsistent with what we thought. Yeah. Yeah. And you now, you, you've written this uh, memoir, yes. and, and you talk about the time when Huey Newton was going to uh, Cuba to yes. escape, and uh, you were left to keep the party together. Yes, I was. Yeah. Kind of You're, phenomenal when you consider that I was a woman, and I am a woman. Yeah. Tell me about it. I mean, your thoughts then, and, and what it was, and what you want us to appreciate about your own experiences. In terms of the Black Panther Party. Yeah. Well, in terms of what you wrote about. Well, I think the in terms of the assumption of power and uh, of the Black Panther Party in terms of the leadership, because at that point the leadership had been really reduced to one man. That was Huey Newton. Right. That was the reality. Now, one of the things you didn't mention is that formerly known as Stokely Carmichael Kwame Ture, was at one point the prime minister of the Black Panther Party coming out of SNCC and there was an affiliation and association. So right. there was a, a, a mixture of, the, of, those, uh, right. of those two uh, tendencies, one could say. Right. But as far as the Black Panther Party was concerned, the so-called militant part, the armed part, um, had moved into another phase. Uh, J. Edgar Hoover actually stated that the reason that the Panther Party was dangerous was not the few little guns we had, he said, uh, with uh, so much machoism, but the, but the fact that we were spreading our propaganda throughout the community, that is to say, to take control of one's destiny and ultimately our goal being the, uh, the uh, not the overthrow as much of the United States, gov United States government, but the complete change of the scheme of things. So when I took control as such of the Black Panther Party, it was my goal to simply continue that program. And at that point, the specifics of that were, was to, the specific point was to control one specific arena, that being the, uh, the city of Oakland, including, as I like to say, port, stock, and barrel, the, the operative word being port, to control the economics and to create a kind of socialist model in one city. How have you changed in your own agenda and in your own political philosophy? In my, own, in my own, not uh, yeah. not very much, other than in terms of stra strategy. I, uh, I, I maintain the same ideological principles that I did in the Black Panther Party. It was the party that shaped me. The mistakes that we made, I reviewed, I tried to review, and the good things that we did, I also tried to review. But in terms of my fundamental principles, I am essentially the same person. Yeah. Let me go now to commentary. T tell me about your own evolution from that time now. And I mean, I read uh, the foreword to, written in 1992, mm -hmm. to your <coughs> book, 
what happened between that time and now for you? Because I know you went to Ghana for a while. Guinea. Come to Guinea for a while. I'm still yeah. there. I still live in Guinea. Yeah. Yes. Uh, I've been in Africa since then. I've been living there. Uh, and my uh, position, of course, has not uh, changed uh, any, you know, uh, as you say, none of the uh, illogical aspects have changed, unlike uh, Elaine. Uh, I've become uh, more knowledgeable, uh, more experienced, and more determined to arrive at the objective of the liberation of my people. Uh, it is clear with the struggle that uh, the only solution now is Pan-Africanism. And, uh, but that was a solution that I remember you advocating at the time, wasn't it? Yes, and I'm still, that's why I'm, at least I'm consistent. <laughs> <laughs> it's one of the prerequisites for truth. It doesn't mean you can be consistently incorrect, but at least you must be consistent. <laughs> and uh, as I learned a long time ago, it's a prerequisite for truth, so I, uh, I'm consistent. Yeah. It's the only solution, so I've not changed. Uh, and uh, my strategy is the mass organization of our people to transform the mass movement of the 1960s to mass organization. Yeah has been the and, central task. And, and many people watching this, and I would say to you too, history has gone somewhere else. And it is now with, with when you look at the number of African Americans you know, who are participating in the Clinton administration in positions of power in the president's cabinet and the chairman of the Joint Chiefs is a, is a black man and an African American. And a whole sense of, of while all the problems remain and, and the disparities in income distribution and all of that, there is, in a sense, uh, a continued, a continued uh, growth in political participation and in the assumption of power, especially at the local level and the state level, and more so in the national level, in the political arena. And therefore, the kinds of ideas that you're articulating don't have the resonance that they used to. Well, I would not agree at all. We have yeah, to not agree. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh. Let us take Los Angeles. Yeah. Los Angeles yeah. Okay, is go ahead. Simply. Example. Los Angeles example. The simple example. The great example. In 1965, there was a rebellion in Watts. Right. In 1992, there was a rebellion in Los Angeles. Right. In 1965, none of the things that you've just advocated uh, were true. In 1965, Sam Yorty was right. mayor. We had no mayors. In 1992, Tom Bradley is a mayor. Right. In 1965, we had no mayors to speak of. In 1992, Africans in America have over 300 mayors in the country. But uh, all of these changes... Detroit and Atlanta, some of them... Uh, the biggest New cities, York. Biggest cities some in the world. Biggest, biggest cities. Biggest cities yeah. in the country. Right. And uh, we, we have now some 7,000 elected officials. As a matter of fact, Africans in America have more elected officials than any other ethnic group in the country. And yet, we have no power at all. So all of these changes have been... But Just, how would you define no power then? I'm coming to show you okay. no power. The fact that the conditions of life of the mass of our people are worse today in Los Angeles than they were in 1965 show that we have no power. We have a lot of visibility. Jesse Jackson seen all over television, he has no power at all. None whatsoever. So they give us visibility but no power. So uh, the conditions of the masses, because there's no power, becomes worse, not better. But I don't think Kurt Smoke would say he has no power, the mayor Ooh. of Baltimore. He has no power. See, why would you say he has no power? Well, let me, let me talk about oh, this. Okay, but wait, let me just tell you, I'll come right to it. Why would you say he has no power? He's the mayor of Baltimore. I mean, he's trying to do things to affect not only um, African Americans, but you, other Americans in Baltimore. I'll tell you why he has, he has no more power. power than... I'll tell you why he has no power. Okay. For us, power can come only from our organized masses. All of our power to bring change in this country come from mass struggle. That's clear. So if the power comes from mass struggle, it is clear to change things Political power can only come from the organized masses to ensure those changes. And since the masses of our people are not organized, he can have no power at all, none whatsoever. If he does, where's his power base? It certainly is not the mass of his people. And if it's not the masses of his people, the power base must be used against his people. Lane. Well, I go back to a fundamental analysis in terms of economics and in terms of the distribution uh, uh, in, in America. And the bottom line is you have David Dinkins in New York. You have Tom Bradley. I, I'm not even speaking about their sentiments. Because Sharon Pratt Kelly in Washington. And there's a big Sharon Pratt in, 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 uh, in Washington and so forth. Um, but the reality is that the power doesn't necessarily exist within the government uh, in the United States. Uh, the military power certainly exists at the, at the head of, uh, at, the, at the national level. But at the, uh, nor at the, in, in the day to day business of the city, the city of New York, <clears throat> doesn't necessarily have its power base in terms of economics 
within the mayor's office. David Dinkins cannot, ma uh, cannot wave a wand and, uh, and, and make, the, uh, make Harlem into the suburbs as everybody, I'm using that as, a, sure. as an image. The bottom line, as far as I am concerned, is the economic distribution. And so the fact that black people in general, black people living in the United States of America, or, or as Kwame says, Africans living in America, uh, have very have no power base whatsoever. The putting on black face, I mean, it would be like saying you could put a kente cloth on Clarence Thomas and all of a sudden he would be a black man. So my position is simply that you can't dress this up by putting a, a certain faces. This doesn't mean that it isn't interesting. It doesn't mean that there hasn't been some change. It only means that that change hasn't been fundamental because the reality is that there is poverty, a tremendous poverty and tremendous disparity as to whites and blacks yeah, generally. We, we just talked about the fact with a previous guest that one out of four children yeah, born shocking. in America today yeah. is born in below the poverty line. He yeah. said some very heavy things in his quiet voice, didn't he? Yes, he did. <laughs> but I, it seems to me that, but and, you know, and I'm the first to to acknowledge, as 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 I think most people do, when they look at the society and they look at L.A. and they look at other places and acknowledge racism that is in our in our cities and in our country. At the same time, a lot of the kinds of of poverty is impacting on a lot of white people as Absolutely. well. Absolutely. You know, and the inability of of uh, the social system. And the inability, not of the system, the inability of the leadership to affect change in the lives of those people, you know, is taking place across racial lines. I mean, David Dinkins can't do it for black uh, Americans or, or white Americans either in terms of what he wants to do with respect to welfare because of budgetary crisis and other kinds of, of crisis. I don't think so. I think it's simply... You don't think it's because of that? You think it's more... No, what? It's, it's simply a question of... Uh, Reallocating the money. Will. I will mean, to do cut, it. <laughs> cut, cut the defense budget from 100 percent. You'll have enough money to feed everybody in America. To cut, but you wouldn't advocate that, would you? Why not? Cut, <laughs> cut the defense budget by 100 percent. My Martin Luther King would be proud of that. I bet you he wouldn't. I bet he would be. I bet he wouldn't be. 100 percent. 100 percent. The Thurgood Marshall just died. You know, who was an important figure mm -hmm. in the civil rights of our country. I mean, he, I never heard him advocate something like well, that. Well, you know, Thurgood Marshall is a good man, but we have different positions here. <laughs> yeah, okay. But Ron Dellums is not advocating that. Even Ron Dellums is not advocating cutting the defense budget by 100 percent, and you know that's true. He's advocating right. more than 50, though. He's, 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 he's advocating, advocating more than 50. He's advocating, 50 advocating we, more than Les Aspen, his predecessor, that's right. and now so. Secretary of Defense is. But, but I think the fundamental issue is exactly that. It's a question of distribution. There, are some, A lot can be done. It's not right. difficult. The Port of New York, or Port Authority of New York, is the single largest port in the world, as I, I believe. Right. I, I assume it is. I don't but know. But yet we have Harlem and people dying of AIDS in Harlem. Yeah. And people die, and child, black children, uh, infant mortality rate 50% higher than white children in America. In America. People hungry, walking on the street, walk outside, look around the street. Yet we have all these millions and, in fact, billions of dollars coming and, into just and, the Port of New York. And what you were saying... Where is that money? And, and where is, is that it, money? Where is it? That's the question. Is it in David Dinkins' hands? No, it's sitting somewhere. So it's a question of, as, he, as, as Kwame suggests, a question of the will to distribute. For example, I, I certainly thought that Clinton was better than Bush. Sure. I consider him to be not Bush. And this means only the question of lifting one's head and getting a quick breather for a minute. But, uh, I mean, I would call on Clinton, for example, to simply issue an apology on behalf of the United States gov government for the 400 years of chattel slavery. I would call on Clinton or anyone else to say, just give us, just lead out with some principles. Black people are talking about reparations now, reparations for Jews in Germany, reparations for Japanese. I mean, these are crimes that have been committed. So that's a uh, simple... Are you calling for uh, reparations? Well, I, we discussed this tonight. I mean, there's some qualification to that, but we in meaning prison, you and Wemmy, or no, or, I listened to uh, what was discussed tonight. Yeah. I would certainly agree that there has to be a qualified discussion, uh, a discussion about this in terms of qualifying what we mean by it. But in principle, yes, I mean, we have a Vietnam War memorial in the in the city of Washington D.C. to heal the wounds of Vietnam. The most visited memorial in the city. But we have not even talked about healing the wound. We have not even addressed the wound of 400 years of chattel slavery or the fact that between 1865 and 1964 there wasn't really a law that said black people were in fact citizens of the United States of America. And whatever I might think about that law, the point is that has not been addressed in principle at the highest levels of government. So it's not going to make that much difference if you put Ron Brown here or Aretha Franklin on the stage if the majority of black people in America are living in yeah. 
a relative poverty. Let me talk about the point that you, what did you think of Malcolm X? Did you, were you critical oh, of the film? Great. Huh? I didn't see, no, the, I no, see film. the film. No, I couldn't see the film. No, no, I'm sorry. No, I, I, I knew the Malcolm X was a, no, was I a hero to you. I cannot see the film. I Why mean, not? The film cannot teach me anything. Anyway, to make a film about Malcolm X, do you know what you have to know? What do you have to know? To know, to make a film about Malcolm X, you at least have to read the Koran. Know it from cover to cover, understand its uh, force. Have you done that? Of course. Okay. To know, to make a film have about... Have you done that, Elaine? Yeah. No, I haven't. I, haven't I have read the Koran, I've read the Torah, I read the Book of Certitude, I've read the two volumes of Nishir and Dear Shonen. And the I've Bible, read the Bible from cover to cover. Of course, I've read the Bible cover to cover many times, and I've read it in jail several times. I read all religious books. I have to. If these books are affecting these many people, and I got to do you think religion is the answer? No, that's not the issue. That's not the issue. I'm a revolutionary, that's clear. Yeah. Religion has to incorporate the struggle. <clears throat> but it's not the sole answer in this uh, instance. It's clear. If that's the case, we would be free because Africans are the most religious people in the world, <laughs> just about. <laughs> <laughs> so <laughs> it's clear that that is not the issue itself. But uh, to make a film on Malcolm X, you have to know Pan-Africanism. You have to know the life of the Honorable Marcus Garvey. You have to know his organization, the Universal Negro Do you really have to know all that to make yes, a film about Malcolm X? Yes, you do X? have to know that. His father was a member of that organization. That organization led directly into the organization of the Nation of Islam with the Honorable Elijah Muhammad. You have to know that. And Spike Lee, in your judgment, didn't know that? He, he cannot know that. He yeah, doesn't and, even, he doesn't even look all, that way. And all the people that he talked to and, and all the research he did and, and following the autobiography that uh, Alex Haley wrote was not enough. The film cannot teach anyone who knows something about Malcolm X. It's someone who knows nothing about Malcolm X can see the film and be yeah. inspired to now learn about Malcolm X. Did you see the film? No, I haven't seen it. For the same reason or for another reason? Uh, not for the same reason. You just haven't had a chance something... to watch many movies lately? or No, I, I haven't been in the United States a very long... Uh... Yeah. You're living in Paris, aren't I'm you? I'm living in France. In, Fra in south of France, or you don't want to know? Or... Well, I'm living in three places in France, as a matter of fact. Because uh, are you... you Vous parlez français? Je fais un effort. Because you prefer Europe to the United States? Or no, just because personal I happen reasons? to be there, and, I, and it makes me very happy not to be in the United States. To, to be here makes you happy? No, it makes me very happy not to be in the United be States. Because... Uh, what? But that's my personal personal life. I mean, it doesn't make me happy that the conditions are here, but I, I have the opportunity to not be here, and so yeah. it's a question of, you know... Why did you there. write the book at this time? I, I took eight years to write that book. I wrote the book for personal reasons yeah. and for political reasons. I wrote the book, one, to open the wounds and, and heal the wounds, my, my own I'm and those. I'm out of time. I'm sorry. I have to, to stop here. I thank you for coming. Thank you very much. Well, we thank you. It's good to see you. Thank you. Thank you for joining us. Be with us tomorrow for a conversation with the Israeli ambassador to the United States. Also, a few good men screenwriter Aaron Sorkin. Good night. <laughs>